Good morning, Kindred. I was kind of wondering if Daniel describes university as the mother church of Kindred. Does that make me your favorite auntie? <laughs> All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that on my resume. <laughs> All right, I want to thank Pastor Daniel uh, for inviting me to preach on the most volatile subject anyone could talk about, church and religion. Oh, this church and religion is the same thing. Politics and religion. Let's see, I already don't want to do it. Um, just a month ago, a political pundit with a huge platform told the people of America that the midterm elections are, and I quote, no longer Democrat versus Republican this is all about control versus freedom. It is good versus evil. We are in a spiritual battle. So while our politicians are telling us um, that our vote is literally a choice between good and evil, Pastor Daniel wants me to talk to you today, and I'm just going to put all the blame on him, <laughs> to preach a, sermons that, a sermon that we as Christians are in fact not in it to win it. Not in it to win it. Just look at your neighbor and say, not in it to win it. Okay, so the fact is, it does not matter who said that quote uh, that I just read to you, because deep down, uh, a lot of us have come to believe that about our political party and about our vote, that it is a deeply spiritual um, vote that we are casting, and it is a good or evil vote um, and so, luckily, we're not actively voting this week, so you guys have a couple months to just pray about this. Um, but I, I do want to be serious, and uh, anything I talk about today, I really would encourage you um, to talk about uh, either the things you agreed with or the things that you really didn't agree with that I said um, with the people around you over lunch. Um, and um, some of these ideas are really hard, um, and I'm not giving you, I'm, I'm going to give you four steps, but it's not like just a manual to lose, because that's what I'm talking to you about today, how to lose. Um, so uh, with that, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to ask Jesus into my heart. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your word, um, but more importantly, we thank you that you are the word, the word of truth, um, who came to live with us and for us, um, to die with us and for us, and to raise us to new life. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts would be acceptable to you, our Lord, our rock, and our redeemer. All right, you guys think we can do this? We can do this. All right, can somebody tell me what is the golden rule of Christianity, the golden rule? Love thy neighbor. Do unto others. Yeah, this wrapped up in love thy neighbor. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Usually, those of us who grew up in the church in the 80s and 90s had a felt board that showed this uh, to us. There's a white Jesus with a sheep. Um, um, so, uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. In other words, treat people the way you want to be treated. Now, Jesus made it pretty clear that the greatest commandment is to love God with all you got and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, most everybody, Christian or not, would agree that if everybody would just act like that, the world would be a far better place. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's totally easy. I mean, when my neighbor posts a funny meme, I push the like button. Done. So you'd think after 2,000 years of people generally agreeing with Jesus that it's good to love your neighbor We'd be living in a perfect world by now, so what gives? Why are we convinced that our own siblings in Christ, other Christians here in this country, we're just going to keep it local, are our enemies if they watch a different news outlet than we do? We are so constantly divided in our country, in our churches, um, in our communities, in our families, so constantly fighting and panicking and Everyone's either depressed or anxious or outraged. So why hasn't loving our neighbor worked? I sometimes imagine Jesus is just looking at the church going, come on, guys, you had one job. And the problem is that this Jesus kind of love is incredibly difficult. We want to grow our movement. We want to spread the truth. We want 
love to win. We want to follow Jesus, but that guy started out with 12 disciples and ended up with 11 and a cross. It, it's hard to follow Jesus the way Jesus asks us to. How are we supposed to win when Jesus goes and says, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you who are listening, love your enemies. Go ahead and repeat that after me. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Do you hear those action words? Love, do good to, bless, pray. Amen. I have nothing else to say. All right. It's called enemy love or the ethic of enemy love. And it should be the very heart and soul of the Christian faith, the most revolutionary concept for overcoming evil in this world. But it is so difficult and it always seems so out of reach. Now, before we can really talk about what enemy love looks like, I'm curious if you can, you know, early we did some deep breathing exercises and we, we set ourselves free from the stress of this world. Now I want you to take a deep breath and imagine the person you hate the most. All right? Picture the names and faces of your enemies. I've been speaking really broadly so far, but I'm curious. Do you have enemies a Newman to your Seinfeld, a Regina George to your Katie, a Scar to your Simba, a Vector to your Gru, a Joker to your Batman. How many of you have seen Lego Batman? All right, I'm gonna keep you guys. <laughs> it is brilliant and hilarious take on the hero villain relationship that I think is gonna give us a little insight into the first step towards enemy, enemy love. So we're going to, I know we're in a movie theater, but we're, we don't have the rights to show you this movie. So uh, we are going to listen to a clip uh, right now. Save the city or catch your greatest enemy. You can't do both. I'm sorry, what did you just say? You can't do both, I said. No, I mean the other thing. Save the city or catch your greatest enemy. You think you're my greatest enemy? Yes, you're obsessed with me. <laughs> no, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. Who else drives you to one-up them the way that I do? Bane. No, he doesn't. Superman. Superman's not a bad guy. Then I'd say that I don't currently have a bad guy. I am fighting a few different people. What? I like to fight around. Okay, look, I'm uh, fine with you fighting other people if you want to do that. But what we have is special. So when people ask you who's your number one bad guy, you say... Superman. Are you seriously saying that there is nothing, nothing special about our relationship? Whoa, let me tell you something, Jay Bird. Batman doesn't do ships. What? As in relationships. There is no us. Batman and Joker are not a thing. I don't need you. I don't need anyone. You mean nothing to me. No one does. Now, that, that's a dark, dark night right there. Uh, I'm going to assume that none of you have an actual super villain for an enemy. Um, movies are like a, a bit more mythological, grand scale stories that reveal something to us about our own reality. So Batman and Joker are indeed fairly obsessed with each other, constantly antagonizing each other, baiting and fighting each other. And the whole premise of the Lego Batman movie is that Batman refuses to acknowledge Joker as his greatest enemy, as you heard, and Joker obsessively demanding that acknowledgement. So until Batman can finally come to the realization of their actual relationship and say with the deepest respect to the Joker, I hate you forever. So I'd like to get to step one of loving like Jesus loves. To love your enemy requires personal acknowledgement. I love in this clip that Batman brushes off Joker and says, I'm fighting a, a few different people. I like to fight around. 
He dismisses the joker as a nothing instead of recognizing that there is a real human relationship between them, even if it is one that is fueled by antagonism. It is so easy for us to get swept away in division when our enemies are just a horde of faceless people, just a them. I'm just fighting a few different people right now. Can you believe the conservatives? Can you believe the progressive, those fundamentalists, those liberals? We set up an us versus them dynamic where we are always unquestionably the ones who are right and they are obviously ignorant, selfish, depraved, and evil. In doing so, we fail to personally acknowledge that we may have a role in contributing the escalation of the problem and that humanity is not just this mysterious horde of them. This summer, I was a team leader for a group of wonderful high school students doing some home repairs through Appalachia Service Project. And I noticed every day we were doing the exact same thing over and over again. Somebody would forget to pack a tool that we really needed. Somebody would uh, measure incorrectly. Somebody would cut incorrectly. There's only seven us, of us, and we are the ones, only ones responsible for our project. But whenever something went wrong, we just we blame them. I don't know who they were, but we were like, oh, I can't believe they forgot the tools again. Like, it was kind of an innocent way to just, like, adjust and move forward. But it's totally what we do all the time in our society. Um, if there was never a them in that little work team, that it was only ever us. If we are going to have this Jesus kind of love, if we're going to practice enemy love, we have to start acknowledging the personhood of everybody involved. This mysterious them um, is, is always somebody with a name and a face and a family and a whole history that led them to conclusions to make the decisions they're making and the beliefs they have right now. They are each made in the image of God, just like us. They are people for whom Christ lived and died, just like us. So imagining that we could just get this far, acknowledging the humanity of our enemies, so what? Do we just live and let live? Does Jesus kind of love mean we just shut up and take it, take the injustice and oppression and violence? Does Jesus uh, kind of love mean that we stand by while abusers create more victims? If so, please talk to Pastor Daniel after the service. <laughs> no, uh, Jesus' ethic of enemy love is meant to liberate everyone who's involved, both the oppressed and the oppressor. So step two of enemy love is do good to those who hate you. The first one was love by personally acknowledging that they exist. Next is do good to those who hate you. When Jesus tells you to do good to those who hate you, he is inviting all of us to actually enter conflict, to enter a very particular way of conflict. Rather than separating ourselves and canceling our enemies, Jesus calls us to engage with them by actively doing good to them. In doing good for your enemy, you will have to engage them on a personal level and at some point, that is going to require truth-telling. Jesus brought peace by telling the truth, not by avoiding conflict. So we can acknowledge the humanity of our enemy. We can um, acknowledge that I want to start doing good things towards them. Um, and that may not just eliminate our, our ill feelings toward them. Anger is a very helpful and useful emotion that can motivate us to take action, to speak the truth, and to stand up for what is right. Um, now, it's, it's hard to do good for someone when I'm very angry with them. So we have to take care that our anger doesn't harden our hearts, that our anger doesn't lead to the dehumanization of our opponents, the demonizing and the vilifying. If your anger is motivating you to speak up, this Jesus kind of love of doing good to your enemies is calling us to pay attention um, to, to stick to the facts of what we know about a situation. What happened that made you angry? Who is being harmed? 
who is doing the harming. Uh, And so in doing good to those who hate us, uh, we release ourselves from cycles of resentment and retaliation and prepare for the possibility of reconciliation. The whole point of this ethic of enemy love is to move us towards the kingdom of God, this kindred community, trademark, uh, where former enemies find themselves siblings in Christ. Sometimes that happens really beautifully. Um, Like you think of the ministry that Desmond Tutu had in reconciliation in South Africa um, after apartheid. Um, And sometimes it it just never happens. Um, The power dynamics are not often even. Um, It's usually the people who have been harmed that have to step up and forgive. And sometimes the people that are the oppressors never learn. Um, So we can't demand that someone who is being harmed or being oppressed just forgive and forget. Um, So step three of this Jesus kind of love is, and you know, I really, I'm getting a little mad that Jesus makes it harder with each of these four steps. (laughs) Bless those who curse you. To bless someone is to wish goodness, happiness, peace, and prosperity into their lives. And that is really hard to do when I would rather my enemies be miserable and suffer for the way that they've hurt me and the people I love. Blessing those who curse you does not mean uh, that you are for their behavior or for their beliefs. It means you are for their personhood, their humanity. Uh, A black theologian, James Cone, says that human beings are made for each other And no people can realize their full humanity except as they participate in its realization for others. And that includes our oppressors. That includes our enemies. So how can anyone do unto others as you would have them do unto you unless we begin living for one another, blessing one another? Isn't the least thing that I want for myself is to just be respected for who I am as an individual, to be acknowledged as someone whose life experience matters too. Uh, If I was wrong about something, I don't want to stay wrong forever. I would rather live in the truth, but you're not going to convince me of the truth by just yelling at me, by just demanding that I see things your way in the heat of the moment. Can we begin to see our enemies like that, the way that we would like to be respected and spoken to. Their actions and beliefs did not emerge from a vacuum. Their perspective was not made in a day, and it will not be changed by my rage tweet, my doom scrolling, or my griping to whoever's in the room. I could drop my truth bomb and back away because that's totally what always works on me, right? Um, Most of our opinions have deep roots. And to respect the humanity of ourselves and our opponents, no one can be reduced to just whatever loud idea is coming out of their mouth right now. I'd really hope to make this a three-point sermon because that would be so Baptist of me. But I'm afraid Jesus had four points, so we're going to have to go to the next one. Um, and God, if this doesn't get even harder, pray for those who persecute you. This I think is the most annoying request uh, because we've become really triggered in our society by this phrase, thoughts and prayers. Um, I think it's very natural uh, for progressive communities to really dismiss prayer these days because we hear it from political people who are using it to not take action. Um, And I, I feel like the people I follow make fun of prayer more than lifting it up, and that bothers me because prayer uh, is an integral part of our faith. We've come to believe um, that prayer is a refusal to take action, that it's just this cheat code used to let us off the hook when nothing gets accomplished. Um, But I think the worst part is that a lot of us have come to believe that prayer doesn't make a difference, that God doesn't care, and that all that matters is what we do. Only our efforts matter. Um, So the first three steps were all about our efforts. Love your enemy. Do good to those who harm you. Bless those who curse you. But this is like a, I got to ultimately trust in God when it comes to enemy love. Pray for those who persecute you. 
What if we believed that God does indeed love you and your enemy? That God does make the sun to shine on both the good and the wicked. That God wants no one to perish, but all to experience salvation. And I think I need salvation from this us versus them logic that I am constantly trapped in. Wouldn't that be nice if all of us could be saved from that logic? Uh, We legitimately cannot set ourselves free without some intervention from Jesus Christ who died for us and them, who took away the us and them and just left us. If loving our enemy is going to lead to liberation, it has to begin and end when we Christians, progressive, liberal, conservative, fundamentalist, whatever label, when we cling to Jesus Christ, the Lord and judge of all of us. And we can be honest in prayer. We can rage to God about all that's wrong with the world and what's wrong with them God is not going to be fooled by you. God is not going to be fooled by the people that have tried to pray the gay out of me. You know, God is not fooled. God is not clutching her pearls by anything that you have to say to God. God sees you and your enemy with pure, unfiltered love. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is alive in you and raising you from this in-it-to-win-it politics that pits you against the world. So enemy love is not like guaranteed to end the cycles of harm, but it interrupts those cycles with forgiveness um, by giving us hope. Uh, it, It interrupts those cycles with the promise that God's love and justice and mercy is indeed more powerful. So we're gonna wrap up back with Batman and Joker. So they never end up on the same side. It would be a very lame uh, superhero story arc. (laughs) Um, uh, but they will, they always remain antagonists. Okay. Um, and it's, it's going to sound a little silly to compare superheroes to American politics and Jesus's call to enemy love. Um, but Batman discovered that there is something more than being in it to win it. Um, when he recognized the humanity of his enemy, uh, when he reflected on their actual lived history, he was able to knowledge that they were in it together. And I will not spoil the movie, so you need to go watch it. Um, You are in this life together, together with your siblings in Christ who drive you nuts, together with those family members who offend you every time they open their mouths, together with the heroes and the villains and everyone in between who thinks that they are heroes. But we are together nonetheless. So love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you, because we're not in it to win it, but we are in it together. Let us pray. God, we thank you so much that um, things don't have to magically work just because we follow you, that we don't have to be superhero level um, correct and righteous every minute of every day. We want to be all in for you, but we, we got to acknowledge that we fall short every day, um, that every day we fall back into this us versus them mentality. And, um, and God, I thank you that you love us um, uh, evermore each day anew. I pray that you would help us to trust, that you would help us to cling to you, um, and that you would help us to begin to see the humanity in every person, even the people that we really just don't want to engage with. Uh, We pray that you be glorified in our lives as we continue in worship in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't usually take a moment to share an anecdote at this point in the service, but when I see God at work and moving in in my life, I just have to share after Charlie's sermon. So uh, this week, I was trying to decide what song to place after Charlie's sermon. And I chose one of my favorites, which is they'll know we are Christians by our love. And I'm about to sing it. I was at the playground meeting up with new moms. And we were talking. And she was talking about her fine lines on different relationships. And she said, I'm Christian, but there's one thing that I've been asked to do that I cannot do, which is pray for a certain polarizing politician. And I had just chosen this song. And 
I listened to what she said, and I was like, I, I've just been meditating on this, praying about this all morning. And I thought to myself, I, I chose the right song. 